how, what is magic? And I don't mean magic tricks. I don't mean somebody getting on stage and doing a card trick. What is magic? Hi, everyone who just came in. There's a lot of answers, so curious to hear what you think. What is magic? Ooh, Katie's deep. Something from the soul. I like that. Yeah, what magic comes from the soul. I can totally get behind that. What else? Hey, Patricia. I feel like earlier examples of magic are are just scientific phenomenon that haven't been explained or we can't explain just yet. But it, right. it, it gives like a sense of like wonder to something, I guess. No, I like that. Yeah, that actually is kind of a um, a layered approach, right? Something outside of science, something that is um, bigger than just you and I. Supernatural abilities. Ooh, fire. Yeah, what else? Yeah, so it plays very much a part in today's talk. Because one of the things, of course, that they say that witches are able to do is magic, right? So that's, it's a very funny word because, you know, some people, um, you know, some people feel that magic is really bad. Some people feel like, um, you know, obviously it's very gendered because when men are, you know, like prophets or when they're magicians, they generally don't get the same kind of, they're not reviled the same way that women witches are. And that was even true, as I kind of mentioned on Tuesday, by the 1700s, as the witch hunts were starting to dissipate, um, hired service magicians in court or among the gentry were kind of a fun thing. That's also the age of alchemy. If you ever study alchemy, what is alchemy? It's the ability to make mat basically turn stone into gold. That's kind of the healing from clerics, the remedy of herbs. Yes. Where did the clerics learn it from? The use of spells and power to con influence or control. Nice, Hannah. It sounds very official and formal. So first and foremost, I think the idea we have to look at related to magic is this idea that goes, it goes back to the earliest times, a belief that there is spirit in nature or that nature is alive, right? It's animated, it's unpredictable, it, it's a force, right? We could even say, the, you know, may the force be with you kind of thing. And so maybe this goes back to the Neolithic, right? We remember in the Neolithic, we talked about, you know, the womb is the tomb and burying, and it's underground, underground where all these mythologies came from about being able to find new life in the underground and then being reborn from that earliest ideas of resurrection, right? The earth is not this hollow thing that's dead. Um, in the Neolithic, the earth was very much alive and part of seen as this whole, right? So um, the then going back to the practices around magic, that belief in magic meant that you had some kind of influence with it when you befriended it. And that even gets into fairy lore, but that's for another time. But it is so fascinating because even working with the fairies and understanding the fairies, I know this is a whitewash term, but it's a very early approach or it's an ancient approach of shamanic method where you are tapping the energies of the magic of nature in order to heal. And then of course, as we know, someone would say, some would say, you know, accuse because they are using the ma magic for ill. This wasn't a big deal until the early modern era. And now this is where I need you to stick with me because this is what Federici says. This is how it ties into women and it ties into capitalism. The witch hunts were the most, one of the most important events in the develop of, the development of capitalism. Weaken, it weakened the resistance of the peasantry by the assault launched against, they, against the peasantry 
by the state and by the gentry. So the peasantry was already becoming more and more poor, right? Underneath all this stuff going on, okay? And it depended on a division. It depended on a fear of women. And so these practices of magic then, magic seemed like a type of resistance. The world had to become disenchanted leave magic alone in order to dominate the earth and make it into something like capitalism would use. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So just hold, hold on to that, hold on to this thought, but like this idea of, um, let's see, do I want to say anything more about that? So around this time, there were these peasant revolts, right? And I've got a number of them here on the page. I don't want you to memorize any of them, but peasant wars, pe re peasant revolts, different names for them in Europe. They were small uprisings of women, men, and children, and they set about destroying the fences as in the enclosures, okay? Because what was happening was there was all this common land the peasantry, yeah, the French Revolution ties into this. That's a little bit later, though, right? Right now, we're still talking about the 1400s and the 1500s, right? But yeah, it definitely ties into that. As actually, did you know that it was a group of women that started the French, uh, the French Revolution because they were disgusted with the cost of bread? It was too high. They couldn't afford bread for their families, and so it's this uprising. And so these uprisings were because the the community lands held since like the Magna Carta were like people who were peasants could still go to the woods, go to the streams and go to the fields. They could hunt, they could fish, they could collect wood. So they wouldn't starve and they wouldn't um, get cold. I mean, or they'd be able to, you know, have wood to be able to keep fires going. What started to happen at this time was the land grabs. Land privatization happened from the cleric, sorry, the clergy and the church, grum, 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 the church, as well as from the state. So dukes and barons, and they were all taking this land and grabbing it and buying it in bulk and fencing it off, fencing off the common lands, which is one of the things that started to drive poor people into the cities very dangerous for women in the cities, right? Women on the roads alone or women who were found, hold on one second, Katie. The, um, I'm gonna actually talk a little bit more about this. So, the, so we actually have something called the heretic and then we also have the witch, witchcraft. Okay, Katie, what were you gonna say? I was just wondering, weren't like priests doing that to like trick people being like, hey, like give me your gold and like you won't go to hell? Right. So what you're talking about is is something when the um, very good the 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 church was so wealthy by this point. As I said on Tuesday, that by 1401 the church had a credibility problem because they were so wealthy and they basically had these different rules. Were like you could some you could come confess your sins or whatever, but you know what? If you pay money, right, then you can give us money and we will absolve your sins. Well, what if you didn't have any money? So, you know, there are no, and there are so many, there's thousands of peasants and there were thousands of different peasants, sometimes women led, that was part of a resistance, pulling up fences, right? And they were rising up against the injustices, injustices of increased taxes and rising bread costs. Because at this time, when they're starting to fence off the common lands and they're saying, hey, we're gonna grow more food. Well, they didn't grow more food to help feed the poor, they grew more food to start commodities, to sell the food, to become even, even more and more wealthy. And then they were putting sheep after the Black Death, they were putting sheep on the lands because wool was the new economy. So there was like several hundred years of mass starvation. People were starving and they wanted to go to the cities to get where the jobs were. And of course, by now, everybody is charging them for rent, right? So we look at this feudal, F-E-U-D-A-L, the feudal system that existed yeah, um, up until the early Middle Ages. 
And we had this kind of, even though we don't really see it this way, the idea of the farmers and the serfs who were cultivating land and growing crops for their lords and ladies of the manor in feudal society actually made women better off. Let me explain why. Because in this kind of economy, women and men both worked equally inside and outside. Domestic work was inside the house was just as important as the work outside the house. People could also tend their own little gardens. Wise women, cunning women, nurses, midwives could also keep their own gardens. But once things started getting fenced off, can you imagine you're a 70 year old woman and you're a renowned midwife and you come home after a long delivery to find out one day that your lands that you had been cultivating had been sold off and now there was a cow there. Your anger and pointing the finger saying, this is not right, might get you in trouble if the cow dies or if somebody gets sick in that family who owns the cow. Do you see how this becomes this very vicious, sick cycle where talking back as a peasant, especially a female peasant, the midwife, the healer, the lay healer, the, the, the cunning woman, the wise woman, and there were wise men and cunning men too, but this was a predominant force that was threatening to the church. We're going to get into why, but let's go back to magic for a second. Okay. So one of the big influences, Montanay brought up a brilliant question. And one of these was this idea that, you know, there's these different compelling elements, these incidents, events, like the peasant revolts, like the Black Death, right? Or how things are shifting. So I don't know if anybody knows what the word pagan means, right? We use, we throw that around a lot today to mean people who do not practice the Christian faith. Well, pagan means country dweller, okay? And so they wouldn't have called themselves pagan. It's just a name that was assigned later. So a lot of these terms we're using today weren't even in effect back then. But basically, because of the deeply, deeply entrenched rituals and festivals and important ceremonies, magical ceremonies, they called them, in order to help and sustain the crops to grow. These were deeply rooted. This is life and death, planting seeds, caring for the soil, caring for the sprout, growing the food, harvesting the food. There were deeply religious festivals, pagan festivals, that the church couldn't get away, you know, out, obviously this is the countryside, right? Pagan as in country dweller. The church couldn't just get rid of it. They couldn't just wipe it out overnight. So they began to target it, right? Women led a lot of these kind of wonderful ceremonies. It was a celebration of the old wheel of the year, the spirit of the green, the rebirth of nature. Remember, magic has energy in nature. And so it's this relationship that was deeply, deeply rooted, that had to change. Yes, now we can get into the question of, was this about older gods and goddess belief? We know that there was something called Venusbergs in Germany, and that we know that at one point, you know, there's certainly a possibility that people in England might have been practicing Diana, you know, the god, you know, worshiping the goddess Diana for millennia after the, you know, the Roman emperor became Christian, right? It's possible there was all this underground stuff. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of feminist theory and, and modern theorists who believe a lot of the resistances by women, because men were getting killed in the wars, so a lot of the resistances that were underground, older religions, older revolts, all kept underground that were kept going by the women. It's also a celebration of the fairies and fairy lore. Does that trace back to old goddess worship? I don't know. There's some different theories out there. There's plenty to read about it. Fascinating stuff. So Ronald Hutton, he's one of the guys that I showed you, um, one of the books the other day, says the unerring and continuous practices of pagan custom deeply enshrined in the agricultural world upon which Western Europe had depended was in direct competition with the church. 
ceremonies related to growing and sustaining crops were well established, and the Christian fathers had trouble convincing people of all incomes and status that their God could contribute as much to the crop and as much to healing as those that were practiced by women's medicine, aka magic. This is one of the reasons why witchcraft was considered a gendered event. So belief in the power of the fairies and its links to ancient goddess worship all undermined the church's dominance. The planting and the harvest seasons every year were matters of life and death. The actions of ceremonial magic in, that encouraged the crops to grow, the sun's return, it was branded heretical, right? Outside of the church approval, that's what that means. The solstices and their different days. Remember we talked about this, about ancient Crete? The, and I'm showing you a picture now of Stonehenge, a 4,000-year-old monument that where people revered the return of the sun every year for the summer. So that's just one of the mechanisms that was shifting then. The church wanted dominance. Women had a lot of control and power in the magic that was going on celebrating the seasons so this had to do not just with healing powers but also spiritual and religious content of the ancients right um, these are just some different pictures in southern europe of look at that shaped kind of like a goddess of an ancient monument in malta uh, which is um off the coast of greece this is um this is seen as um this is the tour atop avalon i don't know if you all have ever studied king arthur but this is like the hill you can really only see it it looks like a an island when there is a um when, when it's really foggy out anyway so these are just some of the practices of western um, Europe that we know that are ancient. We've also heard, of course, about the Druids. The Druids notably were practitioners of, of the healing arts, as well as musical arts, as well as kept alive traditions of the solstices and equinoxes. Okay, there's another picture, a more modern day, you know, celebration of it. Another big component that was going on that's probably tied to what we're talking about, about magic in nature, is this idea of herbal wisdom. I showed you the book called Eve's Herbs the other day. Birth control has been practiced for thousands of years. And what these women as lay healers would have done, would have they would cul have cultivated the herbs using their senses. They would have not called themselves witch, remember, but and they wouldn't have called this term, I'm going to tell you now, it's called empiricists, meaning they were using taste and smell and sight and feel to be able to cultivate a wealth of knowledge over so much time, right? And they would use specific remedies to make people feel better. Maybe cure them. I don't know. But we definitely know we have, through science that so much of painkillers like aspirin is derived from willow bark, right? Or at least it used to be. And so th there was painkillers to ease suffering in childbirth, painkillers to help wounds. So, and there was also just this idea of also increasing fertility as well as being able to not increase fertility. Um, and so this is where, um, you know, at first um, it was one thing to, for, you know, for so long, but after a time, after the Black Death and after the church was facing a credibility problem, the church, as you see in any sense, especially the Catholic church says, go out and multiply, right? Not necessarily good for the mother though, to have 13 children. Um, let's see. So believe it or not, there's actually this, there is evidence that shows like, um, all through Western Europe of the pit, pitted bones in pelvises that they practice birth control in the ancient world. And sometimes you could see that families limited their child, uh, childbirth to two or three children intentionally. Peasants and nobility practice birth control. And then this takes us to the, um, the, the whole new beginning of the physician, the whole university trained physician. And this idea that a physician trained in a university was better apt, actually just had more pizzazz, wore a prettier coat 
than the peasant lady who came through. So we, now we have this idea of magic and healing and medicine as a classist issue. Physicians began to outnumber midwives. Midwives as peasants, they couldn't read. They had no money. They had no access to universities. They weren't really invited. Women weren't allowed to go to universities except unless they really had a huge, huge connection somehow. And they wouldn't, if they'd gotten married, they would have been having babies and taking care of their own homestead by then. So the idea of um, universities began to crop up at the late Middle Ages. Um, Elizabeth I and wealthy women may have been granted access to schools and universities, but it's very rare and they didn't change things for women by any means. But you can find a lot of testimony from authors like Bacon and Hobbes at the time talking about how they would rather receive care from a midwife rather than a university trained physician. Gradually, the university trained physician became more and more aligned with families of rank, and they erased the presence of the women as lay healers. And they begin to target it too. So something else to talk about is, um, oh, here's this, a picture of this, a woman, only picture they have of her. In the 12th century in Italy, there was a woman named Trota, T-R-O-T-A, and she was Trota of Salerno. There's very little of her left, but there are huge compendiums, huge books she wrote on women's gynecology. And they now talk a lot about the Trotaria or all of these things, these contributions of her. But of course, they don't give her a whole lot of, um, a, a whole lot of kudos or aplomb. Um, and so what starts to happen then is more and more um, women, especially older women, are erased. And it's certainly where it started. If you were a widow, um, you know, the stakes were high. Um, political and economic monopolization of medicine meant control over institutional organizations. It's theories, practices, profits, and prestige. It was part of a class struggle. Women healers were people's doctors and their medicines were part of people's communities. But by the end of the Middle Ages, women's medicine became a threat to church's desires. So the church, the state, and the burgeoning medical profession, as well as the clergy, benefited from the suppression of women's medicine. Remember this for the quiz. They benefited from it. Women were excluded from the universities that instituted medicine. They raised it to this newer elite and powerful level within science and academia. As um, interesting, right? We, it's not until the AMA is developed, the American Medical Association is developed in the 1800s, one second Sanam, and that is when, um, when nursing finally opened. But what was nursing? Nursing was the only way women could serve in medicine when, and, and they, you know, they had to basically beg to do it. Begging to do it meant they had to be, nurses were completely subservient to doctors. They could not make choices on their own. It was a long time before midwifery came back into medicine. Sanam, hi. Hey, sorry, you said, um, uh, did you say the Catholic church benefited or? All the churches, but especially the Catholic church was what was dominant in the Middle Ages. Sorry, yeah, I didn't. I... Western, Western Europe, exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you. You bet, you bet. Okay, so um, let's see, moving moving forward a little bit. So one of the, we talked about then one, paganism, the old, old, old beliefs that the church was having trouble, you know, kind of scooting out of the way. We talked about peasant revolts, which women were very much a part of, probably a lot in the underground too, underground revolts, still trying to pull up fences or what have you. Wait till we get into some of this stuff about, about the land privatization, early capitalism. I'm going to wait for a couple of minutes. I know that's a lot to sink in. Um, there's also birth control, herbal wisdom, the idea of magic. See how it unites all of these concepts now? It's So it's not just, you know, oh, she was a witch practicing bad magic. These women, I would gather, were never meeting in the woods to curse and do voodoo dolls. That's racialized. It's black magic. And it I don't, I do not see any evidence of it 
in my 30 plus years of research on this, it all a lot, a lot of that doesn't show up until you start to see the different levels of resistances and you start to employ colonization and as well as enslavement into the practices. Who would not practice bad magic when they had somebody using brutality and violence on them every day, right? So it kind of kind of makes a little bit more sense. But this is something we have to look at it from a gaze whereby this was a targeted attempt to not just erase women's contributions, but have a complete reset on who was benefiting, who was having wealth and privilege. So let's, let's go back a little bit to the idea of women in leadership. As I was saying earlier, women used to be able to have, um, in the feudal period, they shared equally. As we got into the early modern era, which is 500 years ago, we began to, they began to devalue, right? Not just the midwives, but all across the board, reshuffling. So where men's work outside of the home began to be a paid women inside the home, there was no, there was, there was no pay for it. At, to add to that, women's, and I'm giving you rabbit ears right now, quote unquote, domestic work, like sewing and cleaning and cooking would have been a pittance. And if you look at it today, the happy housewife, quote unquote, is still considered that this myth, we've studied it, right? In the first two semesters, sorry, the first two weeks of our semester of this idea that staying home, cooking, cleaning, doing the laundry and the shopping and the what da 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 is a privilege. We have been coached to believe that for 500 years. And so women going to the cities, uh, if y'all saw Le Mis, was very, very difficult for them. Once a woman was raped, she was cast out of her home. Women had, li uh, trying to live on the street or trying to go to the cities by themselves, if they were alone, if they didn't come from fine families. So we're talking about in the peasantry, women were severely disadvantaged. And it is in this time, we get to the next element of the elements of the perfect storm, which is the criminalization of the peasantry, meaning the criminalization, meaning they are automatically deviants and vagabonds and bad people because they have no money, because they're living on the street. And now you're starting to see more and more of the scornful gaze on the woman alone, the woman who has a child out of childbirth, the homosexual, all of this deviancy begins to coalesce into its own social grouping. Um, and it becomes more and more of a class issue. So there's the pauperization, meaning becoming more and more poor of the working class. But then you've also got the merchant class. The merchant class, and this is also where classism comes in, right? The merchant class was burgeoning. We think that's why capitalism is this huge success. Well, it wasn't for women, right? They were being unincluded from all the guilds. That's the beer guild and the art guild and the herbal guild and the medicine guild and the da da da, right? Which is all where the merchants were connecting in order to grow their businesses. So it became, everything became more and more compounded. Okay, so we've covered paganism, we've covered birth control, we've covered the classism ele element, we've co covered black death, we've covered peasant revolts, we've covered the medical profession, right? These are all things you can talk about in your paper that's due this week, right? Pick one, pick all nine, right? Women and heresy. So now you've got this really fascinating idea about, we think about heretics which were women and men who were be trying to still practice Christianity on their own, in their own way. We hear about the very first crusade was, and this is a little complicated, but the very first crusade was carried out against the, a, a small sect of people that were living as what they considered Jesus intended. It also happened to have women as co-leaders, 
women and men could live together, possibly could, they had agopic communities called the Brotherhood Sisterhood. Women could baptize and lead worship, okay? And all of these, these different levels of, 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 of different churches that were popping up around this time, the Catholic church wanted to smush and wipe out completely and dominate, okay? So also the thing about the Cathars, which means live purely as Jesus intended was, you should give all of your money away. Wow. <laughs> and also, they also believed you didn't need God. You didn't need a priest to talk to God, right? So this is where the heretic idea came from, right? It was all of these things that the church did not like. Women and men could both enjoy mobility, a social life. They could both administer sacraments. And they the, the Cathars and the Waldensians flourished like there was high status for women and they flourished for about 300 years and they became a great opposition to the church but what started happening as the heretics started to float away or started to dissolve or started to get smushed down more and more of still women's practices were as in their practice of magic as in medicine as in growing crops began to be more and more under the microscope of the church. So we're not just looking at this idea of just medicine, are we? We're talking about a whole way of life suddenly turning. And the witch hunt was a great, great way to suddenly get really paranoid about who and what women were. This brings us to the sexual politics of nature. Sorry, sexual politics of labor. Okay, so earlier I'd said that women were benefiting pretty well in the feudal society, right? And then they, you know, and then, but then little by little, that, you know, the merchant guild, women were booted out. Universities, no women were allowed to become physicians. No wages, women's work was devalued. Prostitution increased. Indoor value, outdoor value changed. Domestic work became devalued. Sexuality itself became supervised by the church. Suddenly, the church has got all these judgments about, about anything about having to do with sexuality. Women lost their rights to inherit a third of their husband's property. People lost the ability to sleep on church benches. So by the 15th century, women were part of this max, mass exodus to cities, away from villages, away from the common lands. And their, their, their work was a pittance maids, spinsters, seamstresses, prostitutes, alternative families arose then. Um, by 1545, there was an estimate of 6,000 homeless people in Venice alone. Starvation, famine for a couple of hundred years. Food was not shared. It was sold off to other places once it was grown to make money for the landowner. And this brings us to the most important thing of all. And then we're going to do some breakout group, groups called early capitalism, but here we're calling it primitive accumulation. As I'd mentioned before, the common lands, for, from time immemorial, this was how people stayed connected to the land. The common lands was like their living room. It's where they had festivals, outdoor. They didn't have mass halls and, and, and country clubs to go use. They had to use the outdoors for all of their celebrations of solstices and equinoxes, of cutting down tre trees in order to have wood to keep warm. And then it started going away, enclosures, Common lands were sold off and closed off from the peasantry. And that's where those revolts came from, right? Women especially were part of this uprising to pull up these fences, right? As part of a, as part of a you know, resist, right? Common lands had for many generations had been a, a place to do all these things. And now there was a land grab by the nobility and the church. Expulsion of the peasantry happened. So privatization, right, meaning fencing off the land, taking the land away from peasantry, began alongside colonialism. And it took different forms, increased state tax, evicting tenants, sale of the land. But it was also exploiting the starving workers and building capital on their starvation. They were desperate to work. When people tried to put their foot down, they got in a lot of trouble. 
There were these vagrancy laws. Vagrancy laws meaning as in if you were caught being homeless, you could be um, forced to work and fed only forced to work and kind of being enslaved and only fed bread and water. Um, the pro accumulus, the early capitalists. So it's all about real estate, y'all. Um, said the land could be more productive if it was privatized and grow the food supply to increase wealth and feed the masses. But it didn't increase the food supply. I can't stress this enough. It made food more available for the market and export as a commodity, hence colonialism. The two centuries of starvation ensued, leaving people exploited and malnourished. And the modern world is being invented at this time. This became the new transformation of Europe. Old women and widows, childless, were extremely affected by these developments. The combination of rising prices, silver from South um, America, the price of grain, and everything began to rise. Rising prices and loss of those customary rights, like sleeping on a church bench, it left them with nothing. Up, And I would be mad too if I was like, Right. If I was some cunning woman and all of a sudden I've lost access to this land, I've lost access to my own garden and I'm being pushed to go to the cities, I would fight back, too. And when I try to fight back, that's when a finger gets pointed at me by someone with authority. And that's how the witch hunts happened. So up until then, the rural economy had provided for them. Looking at English border enclosures began to private privatize. There had been a community structure. It created this reciprocal land where things did pretty well. Yeah, there was still a hierarchy. But, you know, even peasants in the like early Middle Ages actually slept inside the manor, albeit on the floor, but they had a warm house to sleep in at night. So there's a, there was a big difference between peasantry and lord and lady. There was the yeomans and this person and that person who might have made a little money. But the peasantry that at, at one point was this big became this big with the nobility shrinking to this. And we've been dealing with that 1% versus 99% ever since. Right. Okay. So that's another way. And also the church began to spout these things about how women were sneaking out at night. Women would do horrible things to their husband's bodies if the husband did not become, uh, was not vigilant about his wife. Um, there was a sexuality, a fear of sexuality, a hatred of women's bodies. We saw this from the slideshow the other day. Um, the story of Eve was used to justify women's bodies as evil. Women were much more prone to the devil because of their carnal lust. You don't really think that women have more carnal lust than men? Well, it was taught that way, taught that way by the church on Sundays. Women were more naturally inclined toward evil. Animals were constantly identified with witchery. It defied divided men and women from their trust, husbands and wives from their trust. Women were to blame for men's lust as well as their impotency. Hypersexualization of old women became a tool for witch hunting. They needed sex from the devil because their wounds had gone cold. So these all are different elements. Now we've talked about all of these things, including classism, classism, classism. It's such a big factor because they wanted the land. They wanted to get rich and they did get rich, just like we're gonna see next week. Spain, why was Spain so freaking wealthy? It was so freaking wealthy because the, the conquistadors had figured out how to exploit labor and mine for silver and gold. And they brought it back and they were the wealthiest country in the world for a while until everybody else was like, I want some, right? And so little by little, they laughed and people who are the peasantry, they they made it um, they made it comical, and you see all sorts of ways we and then and then the haves versus the have-nots just became more and more wide. So the um and I'm sorry to break it to you, <laughs> but now you know where all this this stuff comes from. It doesn't come out of a vacuum, and it really is this incredible turn of events. Oh, and the last thing we talked about, right? The propaganda of the printing press. 
Think about how propaganda is served today through our social media. It's just like that. It hasn't gone away. It's only gotten worse. And we have to be really careful. I don't have this here, but there is a very famous brochure that was sent out about, it shows a midwife and it shows a physician caring for a sick person. And the midwife is coming forward and an angel is stopping her and, and saying, no, don't trust the midwife, only trust the physician. So the, pro, you know, the propaganda in brochures was just limitless, it was boundless. Okay. I'm going to stop our, um, what I think is the recording stopping.